to St George's Church today, the ninth Sunday after Trinity. It's very good to have you with us sharing in our service of worship here at St George's in Berlin. For those who are watching our service, you're very warmly welcome to. Our service is a service of the Holy Eucharist, a service of Holy Communion. As always in Anglican churches, all baptised Christians are very warmly welcome to receive the sacrament if normally you do so. Because of the pandemic, we're not sharing at this time the common cup, uh, and we'll be sharing the bread in two stations here at the front. Please, as you come forward, please keep one and a half metres distance to the people before, behind, and on either side. And so as we prepare to meet with God this morning for our hour of worship, may I ask you to prepare your hearts by keeping a minute or two of quiet together. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn number 172 and we
of our loving, liberating and life-giving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please kneel. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. But so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand and we pray together the Gloria in Excelsis. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, revive your Church in our day, and make her holy, strong, and faithful, for your glory's sake. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. A reading from the second book of Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. 
But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. He used to eat, it used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. This is the word of the Lord. Have mercy on me, O God in your great goodness, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my offences. Wash me thoroughly from my wickedness, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my faults, and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your sentence and righteous in your judgment. I have been wicked even from my birth, a sinner when my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth deep within me and shall make me understand wisdom in the depths of my heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear of joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Turn your face from my sins, and all my misdeeds. Make me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Give me again 
the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your gracious spirit. The second reading is a reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to live, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same as one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the works of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity and to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it's equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the word of the Lord. of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St John. Glory to you, O Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were at the place where Jesus had given the bread, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, 
which the Son of Man will give you, for it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread, always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, our Creator, our Redeemer, and our Sustainer. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, we can't really ignore it any longer. Last week, if you were here, and this week, we've had the shocking story in our first readings of David and Bathsheba. Last week, we heard how he sees her in the bath how he demands her, sleeps with her, she becomes pregnant. And when her husband Uriah comes home from war, Uriah is such a faithful soldier and servant of the king that he'd rather sleep at the king's gate and he doesn't go home to his wife. King David then tries to get him drunk. We heard this all last week. Uh, it was a wonderful reading uh, to weaken his resolve. And when that failed, he plots to have him left in the hardest part of the fighting and killed so that he can cover for Bathsheba's pregnancy. And indeed, Bathsheba becomes David's wife. According to my reckoning, it was wife number five, in addition to the harem that David inherited from Saul. Okay, so this is the way that kings behaved. And today, in our reading, we heard how it all came to the light. The prophet Nathan, his heart no doubt, no doubt breathing loudly in his breast, has the courage to confront the king with what he has done. Now, no king would thank anyone who held them to account. Think Henry VIII, for example. I'm not sure he would have reacted as David did to the parable of the rich man and the poor man when David points the finger and says, you are the man. And we sit in our pews appalled at such stories. In the Bible, can you imagine? We'd never countenance such a thing. 
And this is where we have to step back a little to get the big picture. What's actually going on here? The Bible was written by a tribe who were on the receiving end of untold suffering and hardship at the hands of the powerful dominant nations. First it was Pharaoh and the Egyptians, then it was the Persians, then it was the Babylonians, then it was the Assyrians, then it was the Greeks, and then it was the Romans. The people who wrote the scriptures we have in front of us experienced defeat, injustice, and persecution generation after generation after generation. They had been conquered by one empire after another for hundreds of years. And so they write with a particular vehemence towards those who abuse power to take advantage of people who were weaker than they are. The theme that emerges again and again in the Bible is what will you do with your power and wealth and might? What kind of world will you create with it? Will you use it to manipulate and overpower others? Or will you use it to make yourself rich and great and more satisfied? Will you use it, will you use your power rather to help the widow, the orphan and the refugee among you? History, of course, is usually told by the victors, by the wealthy, by the strong, by those who proudly tell of all the wonderful things that they did. The Bible is actually a bit different. The Bible writers question the victorious, glorious type of stories. They don't accept the propaganda of the rich and the powerful and the great empires who seek to justify more victory, more wealth and more power. The writers of the Bible expose what is behind the propaganda, what is behind the grand narrative. They expose terror, manipulation, murder, violence, the exploitation of the poor and they condemn it again and again and again. The parable that Nathan told of the poor man who had his only ewe lamb taken by the rich man, that was the story of the generations of Israelites and Jewish people who have only one lamb and that is taken from them by the rich and the powerful. This is the background against which the Bible was written and the prophets and Jesus and St. Paul lived. And do you see, therefore, the problem that we have living in the capital city of the richest country in Europe, trying to understand these Bible texts? We say, terrible what King David did. But the people who originally wrote down these texts and heard them read in the synagogues, they would have reacted differently. They would have cried out, at last, at last there is justice. Even kings are held accountable. God is on our side. He hears our cries of suffering. We live in a free country. Freedom, human rights, the chance for most to pursue their dreams. It's messy sometimes, but for most, it's a good system to live under. But we also live in a system that's been shaped in the West by liberal capitalism, consumerism, and big business. And this is always based on more. More wealth, more influence, more customers, more bigger cars, more takeovers, more big business, more shares, more shareholders, more product for less money. Because up to now, more always seemed like a good idea. But we're finding out today, not least with the environmental crisis, that more is not always good. Sometimes more is bad, it's exploitative, it's destructive. Sometimes more is even wrong. It's evil. 
One of the central themes in the Bible is the questioning of more. You are looking for me, says Jesus. You're looking for me because you ate your bread and were fooled by it. You always want more, he says. Do not work for the food that perishes. David, David had at least four wives. He wanted one more. I fancy her and I'm the king. The Bible again and again exposes people, kings, nations, systems, empires, rulers who endlessly accumulate more at the expense of someone somewhere else who doesn't get to count. Those whose cry is not heard. Those who live far away. Those who weren't fortunate to have had the chances that we had the generations still to be born. The power of the Bible, the power of the Bible for people like us living in times like these, is that it shows us what it looks like to resist what needs to be resisted, to question the privileges that need questioning, to speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves while at the same time holding on to the central conviction that there is a sacred mystery at the heart of being human. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Eat the bread of life, not the bread which perishes, not the bread of affliction, the bread of bitterness, the bread of cynicism, not the bread of loneliness or the bread of fear. Not the bread of having to be right. The bread of power, the bread of control. Not the bread of guilt and sorrow. Come rather to me and I will feed you with the bread of life. We don't serve the world well and we don't serve ourselves well if we become cynical, pessimistic, jaded and weary. And that's why the Gospel of Jesus tells us it matters what we do. It matters what we believe. It matters how we think about our lives and the world around us. It matters how we treat others, including the estimated 35,000 children as young as seven working in mines in Congo to get the cobalt that we need for our mobile phones, for our laptops, for our electric cars, for our aeroplanes. They're paid 65 US cents a day for their work. Or indeed, the fish and the whales that are eating toxic plastic trash because we'd rather sacrifice the world we're passing on to our children rather than the inconvenience of refusing to buy things wrapped in plastic. How do we stand up against injustice and not lose hope? How do we live with less worry and more joy? How do we forgive someone who has wronged us? What do we do when people in power, in politics, in big business don't seem to have any integrity or any moral compass? When do we take action? And when do we trust that it's actually all going to work out? The Bible shows us that people have been struggling with, wrestling with and arguing about these questions for thousands of years. And the testimony of the scripture tells us again and again that this struggle that we call life isn't futile, it isn't hopeless, it isn't pointless. It's actually divine. Do not labour for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. May Jesus be for you today the bread of life.
and may you in turn be bread of life to someone outside your comfort zone. Amen. We keep a little quiet together. Faith in the triune God. We stand. <laughs> we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one God, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten. Pray for the church and for the world and let us thank God for his mercy and goodness. We sit or kneel to pray. Loving, gracious, creating God, we thank you for the wonderful gift of your creation the earth, the heavens that tell of your glory, for this land and our homelands, for the beauty and the resources and the rich heritage we enjoy. We pray for those who make decisions about the resources of the earth, that we as a generation may learn to use your gifts responsibly. We pray for those who work on the land and in, in the sea, in city and in industry. We pray that all may enjoy the fruits of their labours and marvel at your creation. 
We pray for artists, scientists and visionaries, that through their work we may celebrate your creation afresh. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you for the life you have given us. We thank you for all who enrich our lives and have enriched it over the years. We pray for all who through their own or others' actions are deprived of fullness of life. We pray for refugees, for prisoners, for the handicapped, for those who are persecuted for their religion, for their courage to speak the truth, or for their sexuality. And we pray too for those who are sick. We thank God for those who minister to them. And we pray for those in politics, medical science, social and relief work. And we pray for your church that we may seek to bring life to others. Lord, in your mercy. We thank you that you call us to celebrate your creation. Give us reverence for life in your world. We thank you for your redeeming love. May your word and sacrament strengthen us to love as you love us. Lord, in your mercy. God, creator, bring us new life. Jesus, redeemer, renew us. Holy Spirit, strengthen and guide us. God of peace, let us, your people, know that at the heart of turbulence there is always the inner calm that comes from faith in you. Keep us from being content with things as they are, and that from this inner peace there may come a creative compassion, a thirst for justice, and a willingness to give of ourselves in the spirit of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And a moment of quiet as we offer before God the prayers and petitions on our hearts this morning. Continue to pray for Anna Lee and Byron, for Patrick, for Margaret, for those faced with having to return to their home countries because their appeal for asylum has been rejected, for those whose life is drawing to an end, and those who watch with them. We entrust them all into your merciful keeping. And we pray for them, for one another, and all of God's creation. Praying together, merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing hymn number 271.
Let us pray. As the grain once scattered in the fields and the grapes once dispersed on the hillside are now re reunited on this table in bread and wine, so Lord, may your whole church soon be gathered together from the corners of the earth into your kingdom. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Blessed are you, Lord God, our light and our salvation. To you be glory and praise forever. From the beginning you have created all things, and all your works echo the silent music of your praise. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, the crown of all creation. You give us breath and speech, that with angels and archangels and all the powers of heaven, we may find a voice to sing your praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Son of the Highest. Please kneel. How wonderful the works of your hand, O Lord. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, you embraced a people as your own. When they turned away and rebelled, your love remained steadfast. From them you raised up Jesus, our Saviour, born of Mary, to be the living bread, in whom all our hungers are satisfied. He offered his life for sinners, and with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms on the cross. On the night before he died, he came to supper with his friends, and, taking bread, he gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. At the same at the end of the supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation, may they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Remember, Lord, your Church in this and every land. Reveal her unity guard her faith, and preserve her in peace. Bring us at the last, with Our Lady and all the saints, to the vision of the eternal splendor for which you have created us, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom, with whom, and in whom, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honor 
and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. So we are many, we are all one, because we all share in one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen. Amen. The body and blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray. Holy Father, who gathered us here around the table of your Son to share his meal with the whole household of God in that new world where you reveal the fullness of your peace, gather people of every nation and language to share in the eternal banquet of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we pray together. Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Amen. and living. He declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, so we and all your children shall be free and the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please, would you stand for the final blessing? The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Please be seated for the notices. Very warm welcome once again to St. George's. It's very good to have you with us, sharing in our service of worship. Uh, tonight at six o'clock we're having our first uh, service back in the Marienkirche. We've had a break uh, through the lockdown and we are restarting this coming evening at six o'clock. The Marienkirche is wonderful because it's huge and vast and so you don't need to pre-register. Um, if you'd like to join us we'd be delighted to see you. Uh, we've got a small choir singing tonight. Uh, again it's wonderful what you can do in a cathedral sized building like the Marienkirche. That means that the Sunday evening service is no longer by Zoom uh, because we're in the Marienkirche uh, but our on Thursday evening at 7 o'clock we're having a Zoom a Bible study and evening prayer. So if you'd like to join us, you're most welcome. Please email the office and we'll send you the link uh, by return. We had a great concert on Friday evening. We were raising money for freestanding musicians and also for the well that we're hoping to build this year in Yemen, in a refugee camp in Yemen. There's another concert on the 13th of August, exactly the same. We're sharing uh, the money that we take between the, the self-supporting uh, self musicians. They've had such a difficult time through the pandemic. They haven't been able to perform. They haven't had uh, been able to uh, get an income. So we're wanting to support them. And at the same time, we are uh, raising money for the well project uh, as I said, in a refugee camp in Yemen. You've got the flyer about it. It'll be a, a wonderful concert. Uh, they're the musicians who played the concert last year uh, here in St. George's, 13th of August. Please, there's an RSVP email that you're asked to reply to if you can come. It's written on the flyer. Joseph, welcome back to Joseph. Uh, Joseph's been in Nigeria for two months, I think. Come to the microphone, Joseph. Good morning everyone, I uh, am back again. I was away for two months and two weeks in Nigeria. Uh, it was quite an experience, but uh, to God be the glory. And uh, we thank God for his grace. Thank God uh, for uh, 
keeping us alive. Uh, it's a lot happening in the continent of Africa, and uh, we we'll continue to pray for our brethren, continue to pray for our families, and uh, I just want to use this opportunity to thank everybody for the prayers, and uh, the Lord will continue to enrich you all as you uh, take care of other people, and then uh, also include them in your prayers. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to call a short meeting for the Africans that uh, are present. Uh, just to wait a few seconds after the service. Thank you very much. In the garden. In the garden. The, the subplot, the subplot, which you don't know, is that we're planning an Africa Sunday, uh, probably the last Sunday in August. Uh, if that's uh, suitable to our sisters and brothers and um, we're gonna have to sing and dance in the garden um, because yeah it's kind of difficult to sing sing African music here with masks uh, but come on the 29th uh, of August if that will confirm that date once we hear that it's suitable for our sisters and brothers super thank you so to our final hymn number 214 is it 214 